celebrating Chinese New Year is a long tradition um, in San Francisco, dating back to the first Chinese New Year celebration in the 1860s. Early Chinese immigrants wanted to share their culture with fellow San Francisco residents, even as discontent was brooding, which would eventually set the stage for the 1882 Exclusion Act. After World War II and a positive perception of Chinese Americans, the modern Chinese New Year festival in San Francisco was conceived with the goal of eliminating the mystery of the Chinese feeling. Chinese New Year celebrations have been a long part of American society for over 160 years. Yet as the onset of COVID-19 pandemic has been devastating Chinatowns across the country, many have felt the impact of COVID-19 long before the rest of the country was social distancing. Our Chinese American and Asian American communities have been faced with both the deadliest virus in history and xenophobia spread through misinformation and misunderstanding. And while many would really just like to focus on ushering a new and happy year, xenophobia is forcing our community to once again denounce violence. Today, we are grateful that you can join us to celebrate the diversity and shared experiences of Chinese restaurants across America. The hope of Chinese New Year's has always been to share Chinese cultures with others. So we ask you that after you sign off today, that you share what you have learned from our presenters with your friends and family. The only way that we can really stop the pandemic of ignorance is to educate. So with that in mind, I am pleased to introduce Jenny Bond, the editor of the American Chinese Restaurants book, as well as Dr. Jean Anderson, who will serve as our program moderators. Please give them a warm welcome. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, um, I'd like to say thank you to the 956 people who registered, and I'm sure they'll be coming in and out. Um, uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to share our edited book uh, with the world. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the, uh, the genesis of the book. Um, I myself am a Chinese restaurant kid. I was, I'm from the Midwest, from Ferguson, Missouri, Belleville, Illinois, and I have been, I'm an anthropologist from Fresno State as well as Asian Americanist, and I have been reading constantly, you know, about histories of Chinese food and Chinese restaurants. And having, uh, and generally it's about historical processes uh, focusing on sometimes racism, but having been raised, and which is totally true and very correct, but having been raised in a Chinese restaurant and knowing the positive aspects of, particularly for work ethic, uh, had on me, I, I thought that there has to be, uh, there's a gap in the literature in that how Chinese restaurants are um, in terms of labor and space and consumption. And I was very much influenced by my mentor, Dr. Eugene Anderson, into kind of exploring different realms. And that was the realm that, that was the genesis of the, the book, which is to talk about other stories that are not talked about in, uh, in Chinese restaurants. Um, and I'd also like to thank uh, Gene Anderson, as well as Dr. Haiming Liu. Gene? Yep. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for inviting me on this. Uh, I was a professor of anthropology for many, many years at the University of California, Riverside. I'm now emeritus. Jen was one of my students, and she's wonderful. And uh, of course, I've been eating out in Chinese restaurants ever since I was a student uh, and watching them change in the United States from chop suey houses of the good old working class sort to, uh, you know, mar the mar marvelous wine palaces that flourish now in the San Gabriel Valley and elsewhere. Although you can still find the traditional chop suey house in the old railroad towns of the West. Uh, you know, places like Susanville, California, and Okanagan, British Columbia. It's kind of cool. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I was, you know, very happy to be involved in this book project, which I kind of contributed the afterward and looked over all the contributions. It's really wonderful. I mean, there's, really exciting work being done lately on American Chinese food. There's several histories of it by both, you know, Anglo-American and Chinese-American writers, and uh, more and more histories of Chinese diaspora in Peru and Malaysia and Indonesia and Europe and all kinds of places, too. Uh, it's become a whole scholarly field in itself, which is really fascinating. So, I'm Open the floor to everyone else. Glad to have you all here. Thank you, Jean. And then uh, Jenny, if you could introduce our first speaker. Thank you. 
Yes, speaker number one, Hong Yan. Hong Yan Yang is a PhD candidate and adjunct professor in architecture in the Buildings, Landscapes, Cultures program at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Her talk discusses how Chinese American identities are conveyed through the built environment of three Chinese restaurants owned by the Toy family in Milwaukee from 1913 to 1992. Hi there. Um, let me know if you can see my screen. Okay. Full screen. And Happy New Year, everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to kick off today's discussion. Um, about the kind of multifaceted stories about Chinese restaurants. Um, the objective of my own work is to recenter the focus of Chinese American history to address more of the community's voice and the resilience while recognizing the stories of oppression. My talk today titled, Toys Chinese Restaurants, Exploring the Political Dimension of Race, examines the architecture of three Chinese restaurants in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, that were owned by the pioneer Chinese American family, the Toy family from 1913 to 1992. The first member of the Toy family, Charlie Toy, came to the United States during the gold rush. He first landed in San Francisco in 1881 at the age of 20. The restrictive legislation and discriminatory acts, particularly the Chinese Exclusion Act passed by the US Congress in 1982, prompt many Chinese to seek additional opportunity in the Midwest. Joining this wave of migration, Charlie Toy moved to Oshkosh, Wisconsin in 1885. He made frequent visits to Milwaukee to receive shipments from China for the import business and finally moved to Milwaukee in 1904. In 1913, Charlie Toy's success was widely recognized when he opened his first restaurant on 2nd Street between Wisconsin Avenue and Wall Street in downtown Milwaukee. A six-story building was constructed that included a 300-capacity restaurant, a ballroom, and a 460C theater, as well as offices and living quarters. The building, as you can see here, featured a Chinese architectural style and was reported as the largest and the most luxurious Chinese restaurant in the world at the time. The postcard and photograph here demonstrate the green enamel ter terracotta appear throughout the building. The three dormers on top of the roof featured a Chinese imperial pavilion style. Reading up and down, a Chinese poetic couplet displayed, everybody welcome, good time, good cheer. On March 22, 1913, the toy building was covered in a five-page extensive story in the Milwaukee Journal, an article titled, Toy's Building is Designed Like a Chinese Temple, noted the building as, quote, a veritable Chinese temple in exterior design. The building would attract notice and admiration anywhere. It is Chinese in every line, from the great green dragons, which frown from the skyline at the top of its six stories, to the smaller dragons, which guard the balcony of the restaurant floor and the entrance to the main stairway leading zero. The restaurant interior also feature exotic Chinese cultural imageries. As the photographs illustrate, golden dragons appear on the principal poles and the pilasters. The panel ceilings were elaborately enriched with filigram ornamentation. The teak wood tables were trained with mother of peril. On the table, it displayed typical Chinese seasoning such as soy sauce in ornate bottles that emulate the shape of a fancy Chinese porcelain vase. The mosaic floor was also richly colored. Mr. Toy arranged these decorations that all were made in China a year before. The performance stage had carved fixture and silk embroidered panels. Chinese lanterns were hanging down to light up the stage. A band, 
consisting of seven white men, perform jingle bell in different languages during the holiday season. The toy buildings evoc evocation of Chinese culture, both on the exterior and the interior, created exotic yet comfortable attraction for native-born Americans. Toy's keen observation of Americans' fetish on Chinese artifacts helped his restaurant ironically survive the racist atmosphere in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. His success showed us a different facet of racism. Although the hate and the fear toward Chinese people based on their race was prevalent, Americans had a material fetishism towards Chinese decors, which Mr. Toy employed to successfully enhance the visibility and cultural distinctiveness of the toy building. During the Great Depression, the bleak economic conditions severely reduced Charlie Toy's import business. He closed down the toy building and opened a new, smaller restaurant called Toy's Chinatown Restaurant, located about Walgreens at the intersection of North 3rd Street and West Wisconsin Avenue in downtown Milwaukee in 1938. In contrast with the previous building, as you can see here, the restaurant sign was barely noticeable, which was hidden on the first floor, displaying the English word Chinatown instead of Chinese characters. The exterior of the building merged indistinguishably into the building architecturally. The reduction of Chinese architectural elements also affected the interior. Except for the Chinese decor decorative transoms and the wallpaper you see here, the dining setting at the new location was quite standard American. Forks and knives were set up on every table with a combination of folded napkins in the center. The soy sauce bottles and other seasoning containers were quite simple compared to the ones in the toy building. The plain carpeted floor also contrasted with the previous delicate mosaic floor in the toy building. The reduction of Chinese-ness in Toy's Chinatown restaurant is a reflection of restaurant business economic strains nationwide. During the Great Depression, people's desire to eat at upscale Chinese restaurants or general restaurants like the toy building reduced. Less expensive restaurants became the mainstream. In light of this, Charlie Toy chose to employ mainly simple, locally accessible American furnishing and decorations. This simplified Americanized dining setting also demonstrated the family's embracement of American identity and the changing U.S.-China diplomatic relationship. During World War II, China and the U.S. became allies. Many Chinese Americans served a tour of duty in the American Army forces. The tour family, the Toy family, were well represented in the war service, as you can see in the newspaper clip here. In addition, the repeal of the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1943 also made it a little easier for Chinese property owners to coexist with white neighbors. Perhaps all of this influenced the Toy family's choice to, to present a more Americanized and simplified dining environment that local customers found more appealing. The Toy Chinatown restaurant was demolished due to downtown renovation. It continued to operate at 830 North Old World 3rd Street from 1968. The new location demonstrated the Toy family's effort to revive Chinese architectural features, but in a more subtle way. Designed by Wisconsin architect Mark Fowler, the building emulated a Chinese gate tower and employed the design of a moon gate and a pagoda-style rooftop to mark the architecture as Chinese for American observers. The interior also features Chinese design elements, some having been saved from the original 1913 building. The octagonal lobby is guarded by a ring of multicolored dragons staring down from the ceiling onto the stone-like patio floor. The Tai Chi symbol on the ceiling represents the fusion of yin yang, symbolizing the inclusion of everything to reach a sublime stage. The lobby paths were all Chinese and sparkled with flags of gold. In, the, in addition to displaying Chinese culture, the interior made necessary changes impelled by modernization. In the interview, Ernest Huey explained, quote, once people were looking for atmosphere, we had hard teak wood chairs and marble top tables so ornately carved that you couldn't get your legs under them. Now people want comfort. 
ankled. While the Chinese atmosphere was still highly appreciated by the customers, the balance between culture and comfort became more important here. Toy family's ex uh, exhibition of their cultural pride in the new Chinatown restaurant reflects a new chapter of ethnic history in America, the beginning of ethnic revival. The 1965 Immigration and Nationality Act made the celebration of ethnicity possible. Ethnic groups began to undo the efforts of assimilation of the previous generations and started celebrating their cultural roots. Chinese cuisine became one of the most popular ethnic foods in the nation. This provided a suitable environment for the Toy family to celebrate cultural traditions through the built environment. Through examining the Toy family's three Chinese restaurants, I revealed that architecture is a powerful medium through which the Toy family strategically exhibits their changing identities in order to navigate different historical contexts. Besides racial politics, local economy, cultural perception, and modernization also influence their choices of representations through the building environment. The Toy family used buildings to tell us what it meant to be Chinese, uh, how to visually represent Chinese restaurants in different historical contexts. Thank you. Thank you, Hong Yang. Uh, and then for our next speaker, Jenny, are you ready? Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, Jacob Le Le Levin is a his historian based in central Maryland. His research focuses on ethnic, religious, and civil rights history in Baltimore, Maryland. His previous publications have centered on the intersections of race, religion, activism, and where they meet with food and sports history and culture. Today's presentation will examine the cultural connections between Chinese food and the Jewish American community. Hi everyone, uh, thanks to the CHSA for having me and Happy New Year. I uh, wanna start my presentation here. There we go. Um, so let's jump right in. In 2010, Supreme Court nominee Elena Kagan was asked in her confirmation hearing by Senator Lindsey Graham, where were you at on Christmas? And now Justice Kagan replied, you know, like all Jews, I was probably at a Chinese restaurant to the laughter and applause of the entire room. But to get to the roots of why this made the whole room crack up laughing, we need to jump back over a century to 19th century New York and the arrivals of the main actors in our story. Between 1880 and 1920, approximately two and a half million Eastern European Jews arrived in the US, coming from, if you look at the map in the bottom right corner, that dark blue portion from Central Europe all the way across Russia. By 1910, over one and a half million Jews lived in New York City, most of whom settled in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, but there were only around 10,000 Chinese immigrants next door in Chinatown. This wave of Jews coming from Eastern Europe were more observant, more religious uh, in terms of their dietary restrictions. They kept kosher much more strictly, and they were poorer than earlier Jewish arrivals. In terms of keeping kosher, there are a few big rules. There's a lot of them, but the big ones are no mixing of milk and meat or dairy and meat, no pork, and no shellfish. Uh, the symbols you see on the image on the left, if you go to a convenience store or supermarket right now, you'll find on hundreds of items that the uh, manufacturers have gotten certified kosher, so they're open to everyone, but religiously observant Jews know that they can eat them. So when that generational wave of Jews came, by the time their children and uh, grandchildren, second and third generations, uh, they had a little bit more money, they had um, the desire to break out of their parents and their religious codes and upbringings. And the easiest way to do this for a lot of Americans to experience other cultures was to go and eat out in a restaurant. Um, for Jews, a lot of different cuisines, it was difficult because whether it was the food, uh, whether it was the Christian clientele or outright anti-Semitism of the owners of the establishments, 
Jews tended to feel more comfortable in Chinese restaurants than they did in, say, German or French restaurants. There was also this idea that the second and third generation, uh, and to this day, could enjoy Chinese food through the idea of, quote unquote, safe trafe. Trafe is the Yiddish word for non-kosher foods. And this idea of safe trafe meant that in Chinese cuisine especially, um, non-kosher items like pork or shrimp could be shredded finely and essentially mixed up in the food so that the, the diner could give themselves a type of pardon for violating the religious rules, but only when they're out at the restaurant. So as that was happening in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, uh, Chinese restaurant owners also actively sought out Jewish customers, uh, both based on the proximity of the two neighborhoods, but also as it grew around the country, Chinese restaurants popped up in a lot of heavily or more densely Jewish neighborhoods. Starting in the 1970s, Chinese restaurants actually went out of their way to get kosher certified, meaning that no matter the clientele, they can enjoy the food, but for still religiously observant Jews who kept kosher, they could go out and enjoy a meal uh, knowing that it did not violate any of their religious observance requirements. One such example, and the one closest to myself, is David Chu's China Bistro in Baltimore, Maryland. You can see from the uh, image on the right, the establishment is under strict, a strict star K kosher certification. Uh, it is one of the most stringent types. There is no outside food allowed, no ingredients in the kitchen, no preparation of ingredients that would in any way violate any kosher rules. Now, my wife and I did have uh, the opportunity to go out and enjoy some research at this restaurant while I was writing my chapter. Beyond kosher restaurants, we see uh, cultural festivals nowadays celebrating this historic and current relationship. In the Lower East Side, the museum at Eldridge Street for over two decades has held an annual festival called Egg Rolls and Egg Creams that focused on um, sights, sounds, foods, language, dance, culture uh, between the two communities and the things that they exchanged um, between uh, their own experiences over the last century. Uh, in the last few years, in fact, to now incorporate the strong Puerto Rican uh, populational influence in the area, they've expanded the festival to egg rolls, egg creams, and empanadas. But to expand on our popular references every year, and really the motivating question that brought me to do all this research was every single year around Christmas time, you'll see an image like this shared in social media posts. This sign, um, I have family who believe who we saw it in Chinese restaurant windows welcoming us. It says the Chinese Restaurant Association of the United States would like to extend our thanks to the Jewish people. We do not completely understand your dietary customs, but we are proud and grateful that your God insists you eat our food on Christmas. Um, the true origins are unknown, and I wrote about it more in my chapter if you had the chance to read it. But beyond social media posts, the mainstream media every single year writes this story over and over and over. You see articles like I have listed here from the Nasher, from National Public Radio, Time Magazine, Vox, The Atlantic, Mike, and they are all under essentially the same theme. Why do Jews love Chinese food and why do Jews eat Chinese food on Christmas? They range from deep, uh, thoughtful, personal oral histories that stretch back into the scholarship, or they have basically superficial answers of Chinese restaurants are open on Christmas, so where else are Jews gonna go eat? Um, but it is also a popular theme amongst uh, different type of media. Here we see uh, late night comedy comes up every year. Christmas time for the Jews was a Saturday, night, a Saturday Night Live sketch that first aired in December 2005, where lyrics make reference to Jews being able to eat in Chinatown and drink their very sweet kosher wines. Feature films have made reference to it here. We see the 2015 Columbia Pictures Seth Rogen movie, The Night Before, where he and his friends have an epic Christmas Eve and here you see him in his ugly Christmas sweater with the Star of David. 
uh, giving a nodding of acknowledgement to a table of Hasidic Jews that he's walking past in his Chinese restaurant. Big Bang Theory, network sitcoms talk about it. There's a very interesting clip that I'll uh, ask Maggie to make available later that you can find on YouTube where uh, an entire joke segment is written because their Chinese takeout order forgot the fried rice. So the only Jewish character on the show, Howard Wolowitz, calls the restaurant and speaks to them in what's supposed to be Mandarin, but I'm guessing is probably a poor Hollywood translation. Uh, but the joke is that not only would the Jewish character go on about it and call the restaurant, he would speak to them in Mandarin themselves. You have The Marvelous Miss Maisel, which was an award-winning comedy from Amazon. Uh, and in the first season, when uh, Maisel's father gets a big new job to go out to celebrate, they go to a restaurant called Ruby Foo's, which no longer exists. But the set designers worked very hard to recreate a huge... Um, Chinese palace based on the real Ruby Foods, which existed uh, up until the 1960s or 70s. And this is also a topic that's near and dear to myself. Uh, in 2016, before I was married, my wife, my now wife and I, we took uh, her parents to their first Christmas Day Chinese buffet. We went to Buffet City in Brookville, Florida, and let me tell you, it was completely packed. 2017, we went somewhere else. Uh, in July, when her family came in for our wedding, this is an image of all of her aunts and uncles and spouses at my favorite Chinese restaurant, our local Hunan legend. 2018, back at Buffet City in Florida, in the picture on the left, you can see my mother-in-law photobombing uh, and making an appearance. Uh, and to close out, I wanted to reference um, the Tablet Magazine did a huge project where they had authors and chefs and historians write about the 100 most Jewish foods. And they're all the things you would expect, bagels and lox and brisket and deli uh, and seltzer water, everything you can think of. And for Chinese food, they invited a New York rapper named Action Bronson to come and write a love letter to Chinese food. And in short, he wrote, Chinese food is as Jewish as matzo ball in New York City. Chinese food is not a phase. This is forever. This is a lifestyle, a Jewish lifestyle. And that is a very truncated version of how Chinese food became the most Jewish of all non-Jewish foods. So thank you everyone for your attention and I'll turn it back over to Jenny and Maggie. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Jacob. Um, Maggie, I'm going to introduce uh, Carol Chan and Maria. If that's okay. Oh yes, go for it. Carol Chan is an assistant professor at the Social School of Sociology at the University uh, Dodd uh, Humanoso Cristino. My apologies. Uh, Maria Mott uh, Stabucci is an assistant professor at the Institute of uh, History at the Universidad de Chile. Their talk presents the dynamic ways in which Chinese-ness and the quote unquote and the contemporary Chinese identities are being articulated and contested in diverse Chinese restaurants in the capital city of Santiago, Chile. And just so everyone knows, they were unable to make today's uh, program, but we wanted to make sure that they could still share their research. So um, I will be sharing a pre-recorded um, presentation from them for everyone. So if you do have questions for them, please let us know and you can contact uh, CHSA if you want to get in contact with them directly to learn more. Thank you. Carol, and this is Maria, and today we are going to talk about negotiating Chineseness in Chinese restaurants in Santiago de Chile. The Chinese in Chile have historically been marginalized in the country. Although they have been present in Chile since the 19th century, today they are still not accepted as Chilean and are largely considered a foreign population. They are also overlooked in public discussions of migration where the focus is on Latin American migrants. One of the oldest industries in which the Chinese have been involved and known for in Chile is the food industry. In Santiago, the Chilean capital, Chinese restaurants are second in number to Peruvian restaurants. 
They're usually perceived as being inexpensive and family friendly, where the food is abundant, as affirmed by you Chilean user reviews on Google Maps or TripAdvisor. Ethnic restaurants such as these can be viewed as diaspora spaces where minorities and migrants negotiate their identities and place in society through ways of presenting their food and aspects of their culture. In this video, we introduce the diversity of Chinese restaurants in Santiago to analyze some ways that ethnic Chinese persons and their families in Chile reproduce and or subvert enduring representations of Chinese persons and, Ch and Chineseness. Chinese restaurants play a key role in discourses of migration and representations of the Chinese as exotic, incomprehensible other in Chile. Partly because Chinese restaurants are ubiquitous in the city landscape and constitute the main form of contact many Chileans have with the Chinese population. The visibility of Chinese restaurants in Santiago as Chileans know them today can be traced to the mid 20th century. According to our interviewees with multi-generational familial involvement in the industry in Santiago, there was an initial increase in visibility in elegant Chinese restaurants selling Chinese food in Santiago in the 1960s and 1970s, including the restaurant Tang Fang, a place described as having an exotic ambience. Later, smaller and more diverse types of restaurants, such as takeaways, appeared in different areas of the city from the 1980s. Many Santiago residents today are familiar with a fairly standard menu in Chinese Chilean restaurants, where the key items, as you can see in this image, are chop sui, carne mongoliana, and wantan frito. These restaurants constitute the majority of Chinese restaurants throughout Chile and are multi-generational family businesses, where the family's origins are usually in Guangdong, China. The food is inspired by Cantonese cuisine and adapted to Chilean tastes. The style of these restaurants tend to be traditional, with decorations that the, that the restaurants create as Chinese spaces, Chinese deities, porcelain vases, or even as we can see here, a portrait of Mao Zedong. Traditional Chilean Chinese restaurants um, tend to be modest, simple spaces, but some can be more elaborate and invest in Chinese style architecture or elaborate furniture and decorative objects. These restaurants can be said to largely reproduce stereotypical ideas about Chineseness, where exoticizing Chinese food and restaurants as foreign but not too foreign was a strategy to appeal to customers. One restaurant owner, for example, told us that she chose the decorative items because the customers liked that sort of thing. A few restaurants sell authentic Chinese food that include dim sum, whole fish, and Chinese vegetables. These often have two menus, a Chilean one and an authentic Chinese one. Based on several of their own accounts, these restaurants started in the late 1980s and early 1990s when there was a surge in Cantonese Chinese migrants in the city, along with their restaurants. This group of authentic restaurants had a common strategy to cater during the day and the week to Chilean customers and in the late night to Chinese consumers. By juxtaposing Chinese and Chilean Chinese menus, these restaurants signal explicitly to their Chilean consumers that they are not consuming real Chinese food, but rather dishes modified for their specific tastes. Thus, the presumed reciprocal relationship in the institution of multiculturalism, or Chinese integration, is revealed to be unequal between producers and consumers. One restaurant goes so far as to spatially segregate its clientele. One wing of the restaurant is reserved for the mainly Chinese clientele ordering from the Chinese menu, and the other wing for the mainly Chilean clientele ordering from the Chilean menu. A third category of restaurants demonstrate a desire to go beyond these categories of Chinese and Chilean Chinese, expanding ideas of what China and Chinese restaurants as spaces can constitute. These serve as examples of how transnational and transcultural ties of the Chinese shape their inclusion of typically non-Chinese cuisine and aesthetics in their restaurants, partly due to economic pragmatism. Generally, owners and managers told us they started incorporating Thai and or Japanese food due to Thai or Japanese chefs that came to them looking for work. This inspired them to expand their menus and cater to increasingly cosmopolitan clientele. Reviews of these restaurants would praise their authentic Thai or Japanese food while still calling them Chinese restaurants. This is another example of a restaurant that subsumes diversity under the guise of a Chinese restaurant. It began to incorporate Peruvian food in its menu due to the arrival of Peruvian cooks. These restaurants not only expand ideas of what Chinese restaurants can contain, but also what kinds of cuisines, practices, and persons can belong in these spaces. 
In the past decade, Chinese restaurants have been increasingly modernizing their aesthetic and identity. Here we see an example of a restaurant that displays a minimalist, modernist aesthetic with a focus on still expressing its Chinese identity, with its round tables, its logo as a traditional Chinese seal, and its name, Neo China. It is a shift away from the traditional Chinese aesthetic that referenced pagodas, dragons, and the Chinese deities. Its menu is also more than fusion, incorporating not only sushi, but also other pseudo-Japanese plates they call tepanshu, a mix of tepanyaki and chop suey. Yet, the restaurant declares proudly that their chefs are direct from China and can prepare traditional dishes suited to the Santiago dwellers' unique tastes. What Nueva China's restaurant owners claim here is that Chineseness is embodied. Thus, the presence of Chinese chefs and owners mark the production of spaces and food by default as authentic experiences of China. Chineseness and ideas about Chinese food and restaurants are changing constantly in Chile with an increasingly diverse Chinese population and sophisticated clientele. Since our chapter was written, we have observed more specialized restaurants in the city, Peruvian Chinese and Venezuelan Chinese restaurants. These are run by ethnic Chinese persons who migrated from Venezuela, for example, who offer the Chinese menus and dishes available there due to their unique Venezuelan tastes and own histories of menu and dish production there. These differ from the typical dishes that come to characterize Chilean Chinese restaurants. The diversity, not only in Chinese restaurants in Latin America, but also within Chile, highlight the complexity of Chinese identities and interactions with local populations in these places. Thank you very much. And special thank you for Carol and Maria for sharing um, their presentation, even though they weren't able to be here today. And our next speaker, or we have two speakers again, um, Yes, uh, thank you again to Carol and uh, uh, Maria. They're actually from Chile. And so um, thank you for sending us uh, their video. Rick Miller is a geographer whose research traces the interaction of people and their built environment. Nicholas Bosch is a Master's of Fine Arts candidate in the Department of Art at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. Their presentation examines the suburban landscapes east of downtown Los Angeles, arguing that domestic built environment of these neighborhoods are integral to the understanding of the quote, new American Chinatown. Great, again, thank you so much for having us here. Happy New Year to everyone. So I'm gonna start and Nick is gonna jump in as well at various points just kind of outline what our chapter in the book was about and talk a little bit about um, why we've uh, termed this uh, California conurbation or a visual habitat study for Chinese restaurants in this California conurbation. And the, the California conurbation that we're talking about will be the San Gabriel Valley. And I just want to point out, I, I realize many of our uh, listeners in the audience are from the Los Angeles or Southern California region. Um, but there are many of you who are not. So I just want to talk a little bit about uh, what this place is and, and um, Nick will fill us in a bit more about how it got to be this way. Um, just to point out, uh, there is a quote unquote Chinatown in Los Angeles that's close to the downtown area. And this is a place that we will not be talking about in this process. So if we just look at the, the Los Angeles general map, um, we get the beach and, and the airport um, on one side, and then downtown Los Angeles with its quote unquote Chinatown here. And where we're gonna be going in this talk is to expand a little bit eastward into what's known as the San Gabriel Valley, um, which is comprised of a number of towns. And in this map, or if we zoom in here, uh, we can start to see the, the outline of our study area, which crosses boundaries into a number of different towns or different uh, incorporated cities that uh, line this, this valley, and there are actually others that go beyond here. And the kind of characteristic of this region is sort of an overwhelming um, vernacularism, um, which has a, a certain kind of consistency to it. It's, it's consistent with 
a Southern California vernacular environment. Um, the habitat mostly made up of single family dwellings, um, although increasingly uh, there have been older and, and many newer uh, multi-unit dwellings um, that have come into this region. And um, our study was really to kind of understand something that between the, the restaurants and the habitat, um, there's actually a, sort of a larger continuity in place. And we'll call this something of a landscape, this, this continuity that crosses boundaries and reminds us that the social, political, and economic context in which these Chinese restaurants are taking shape. That restaurants are not solitary ent entities, but they're always made up from all kinds of different things, which include capital, labor, customers, the deliveries of perishables, and any, any number of other kind of interactions that cross this landscape. So I think uh, Nick will, will say a bit more about the kind of making of this place and some of the kind of conceptual frameworks that we've used. Yeah, absolutely. Um, hey, everybody. Um, uh, maybe if Rick, could, could you just give me a thumbs up that I'm audible? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, my name's Nick Bauck, and thanks again, everyone, for coming. Um, yeah, it's, um, so I think um, an interesting place to start in this little brief story that we're telling is um, to go back to this idea that Rick brought up about the downtown Los Angeles Chinatown um, compared to the region that we're talking about, which is uh, a suburban landscape east of downtown. And by 1990, 4% um, of the Chinese population in Los Angeles lived in the downtown Chinatown. So to put a point on this, that's a very small number, especially as compared uh, with other major US cities, uh, San Francisco and New York chiefly, um, where the population of, of um, uh, Chinese in those cities uh, would have been much higher than only 4%, which means leaves the question, where, where was everyone living? And the answer is, um, as we've uh, suggested already, uh, a large part of this population was inhabiting uh, the the suburban landscape east of downtown called in we call it and 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 it has been called in the literature for a number of decades now an, an ethnoburb um, and so um, why did this happen here in southern california uh, uh, and, and how do we get our head around that process a little bit and um, one of the things that that historians have pointed to uh, is that if, if you think coming off of one, the Industrial Revolution, to World War II, um, there is an increasing um, internationalization of the global economy, but also the global urban economy. And when people started migrating in um, in in large numbers to Southern California, from especially Taipei and from Hong Kong, they were doing so as people who are already sort of um, part of that um, more uniform urban global economy. In, in other words, they had um, middle-class jobs a lot of times that, that translated uh, fairly well to moving to another like big city uh, in a different part of the world. And this was only increased by uh, real estate boosters um, of course, a very, a very Southern California story, uh, um, though this time starting uh, really in earnest in the, the, the suburb of Monterey Park, we're encouraging uh, um, people putting maps of Los Angeles and Taiwanese newspapers, showing move to Monterey Park, this is where, um, you know, if you're, uh, if you're, if you're moving from um, from China to Southern California, uh, this is where you should come. Housing is affordable. There will be the economic infrastructure there. Um, you can actually also adopt part of this um, sort of American dream landscape that had existed for for the decades before that, since the since the um, late nineteenth century. 
Um, and so specifically, that's one of the points Rick and I were really interested in this is the visuality. We're both photographers, we're both geographers, um, and have this very sort of, um, um, I'd say a strong interest in um, the aesthetic of um, what these places mean or, or what the aesthetic of what these places are in terms of their their built environment and the fact that there's an adoption of the housing stock that had existed uh, and turned into this uh, Chinese, essentially what is now uh, a Chinese ethnoverb. So, um, so we, yeah, we I think maybe... to these, these sort of juxtapositions then of the Chinese restaurant and, and that context of the Chinese restaurant with the habitat, with, with the kind of the living spaces just in the immediate background and often overlooked um, in, in some sense that the Chinese restaurants become the most visible uh, recognition of the San Gabriel Valley um, as a kind of Chinese or Sinicized space. Um, but where people live becomes something of like the, the dark matter of this universe that it makes up the bulk of the, the region, um, yet it kind of fades into the background. So right, I think, and then... um, yeah, if you in want to go fact, ahead and do we talk have... about the, that juxtaposition. Yeah, absolutely. Do you know, Rick, if we have the, the map slide? And if not, that's okay. I can I... quickly describe it. You can go to that in, in a moment. It's coming up? Okay, great. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah. So, right. So, so photographically, getting back to that point, we're really interested in this kind of this micro phenomenon, what we call the liminal space between these centers of great commercial interest, um, which are these Chinese restaurants, here's Chengdu Taste in Alhambra. And then as you can see in the slide, alley as liminal space. And just across the alley is the beginning of what is actually the, uh, the massive majority of the land use, uh, which, is, which is housing. Um, and so, um, you know, uh, and here's the map. Yeah, exactly. So you can see there's a major corridor called, uh, this is Valley Boulevard running uh, east-west at a slight tilt there. Uh, and then there's San Gabriel Valley running north-south, the other kind of main corridor. And so these are the, this is how this space is arranged in this part of um, LA County, um, where you have these main commerce corridors and then most of the rest of the space where all those like R and C's are and all the rectangles are, are housing. Um, and so liminality, this it's it's a concept, right? It, it's it's in between. It's it's part one thing on the way to another thing. Um, and as geographers, you know, Rick and I are really interested in the idea that this can also be a physical space, a materiality, something you can touch. You can be in a liminal space. Uh, and and to really like get into the nuts and bolts of this region, um, in terms of its Chinese restaurant, it's really interesting to think of what what is the in-between? When are you sort of in a space operating by its own customs and laws, laws even sometimes, or unwritten laws, kind of non-state laws? Um, um, here's an example of, uh, a rare example actually, where you can be sitting just on this commercial strip outside of a, I think this is Sichuan Impression, um, and looking through these uh, sun, sun shields into the neighborhood. And this is really, it's a beautiful shot because it's the exception that proves the rule um, that, that there actually isn't, um, it, oftentimes when you go to these restaurants, um, when people go to these restaurants, it's a point location. Um, you, you may even know about this if you're a tourist from uh, um, Shanghai or something like that, um, where you, you think I'm going, I wanna go visit one of these well-known San Gabriel Valley restaurants and you and sort of go to the restaurant and then go back to wherever you are staying, not not seeing the neighborhood in which it's situated. So this it's the liminality is, is it's uh, just really interesting to us as a space of performance um, uh, and performing that um, um, the move between the, the point of attraction the Chinese restaurant and sort of where life happens, where labor happens, where the knowledge happens that fuels these, um, the kitchens in the Chinese restaurants. 
And Rick, do you wanna? Yeah, so just it, for those who are interested, there are, there are of course other papers and other books out there um, about this, but um, I think we'll, we'll wrap it up and just um, we'll offer a, a thank you for your conviviality, for joining us here and, and for letting us join you. So with that, we'll turn it back over to Jenny and she'll do the next introduction. Thank you, Rick and Nick. Um, if you want to look at the chat is uh, on fire, a lot of people from 626. So uh, <laughs> excellent. <laughs> um, um, Anthony J. Miller is an assistant professor of history at Hanover College, where that he teaches courses in the history of East Asia. His talk examines the historical construction of quote, authentic, unquote, Chinese food in the U.S. Midwestern state of Ohio since the 1970s and considers it a, its ramifications for immigration, cross-cultural di uh, diplomacy, and U.S.-China relations. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. And I think everyone can see my slides now. This is my talk of my chapter. Uh, talk doesn't cook rice, Chinese restaurants, and the Chinese, in parentheses, American dream in Ohio. So I'm going to start by just kind of giving you an overview of some of the key points in my chapter uh, that really starts with this family, Mike Wong, who in 2017, the Cincinnati Enquirer celebrated his retirement as owner of the Oriental Walk by calling him, quote, the poster child for the immigrant American dream, a long tradition of well-known well Chinese restaurant hosts in Cincinnati, genial men who act as a bridge between cultures and friends to their customers, impresarios of Chinese food, end quote. And true enough, in the early 20th century, Southern Ohio was actually home uh, to a number of Chinese restaurant owners, such as uh, Charlie Yi, who overcame racism and discrimination to gain acceptance from the wider Midwestern community. Charlie Yi was known as the mayor of Chinatown in Cincinnati in the 1940s and 1950s, and he had translated friendships with city officials and the popularity of chop suey's cheap exoticism into a powerful tool for cultural diplomacy. While running his restaurants, he helped raise thousands of dollars for the Guomindang during the Second World War, and he also promoted the rights of Chinese migrants living in Ohio. Like Wong, Yi's retirement in 1961 was greeted by the Cincinnati Enquirer as proof that, quote, the American way is better for Charlie Yi and his children, end quote. And Yi's success was kind of held up by that newspaper as symbolic of the larger Chinese-American experience in the U.S. history. But in reality, the historical context surrounding Wong and Yi were vastly different, as was the type of Chinese cuisine their restaurants served to Ohioans. In his own mind, Mike Wong of the Oriental Walk arrived in Cincinnati at a fortuitous moment. He said, quote, Nixon had just gone to China and people were interested in Chinese food, excited about it, end quote. Indeed, from the 1970s onward, newer generations of Chinese restaurant owners translated America's curiosity for authentic cuisine into roles as cultural emissaries, urban tastemakers, and the means for fulfilling their own American dream. By introducing regional cuisines like Sichuan or Hunan, Wang's Oriental Walk succeeded in using the cultural diplomacy of food to create a more positive image of Chinese Americans and also their cultural heritage. And within a historical context of growing trade and immigration connecting Ohio to Taiwan and the People's Republic of China, eating authentic Chinese food came to symbolize a desire to embrace a more multicultural and racially diverse Midwest. In the past few years, though, the politics surrounding Chinese cuisine in Ohio have changed dramatically. Owners and employees of Chinese restaurants, many of them very recent immigrants and students, operate their businesses in a state where President Trump's message of America first resonated powerfully with voters in the 2016 and the 2020 elections. Fears of Chinese economic power cross party lines, though, in Ohio, 
and have a longer history than just the Trump administration. Ohio Senators Rob Portman, a Republican, and Sherrod Brown, a Democrat, have for the last several years railed against the People's Republic of China as a threat to the U.S. economy, with Brown claiming that trade with China has, quote, meant shuttered factories, lost jobs, and devastated communities across America, end quote. Conversely, the Buckeye State's farmers were among the hardest hit by the trade war instigated by the Trump administration against Beijing. Along with rising economic anxieties, the focal point of Chinese immigration in Ohio has shifted away from Chinatowns and metropolitan areas towards suburbs and college towns that are homes to thousands of international faculty and students hailing from China. Nowhere are those changing dynamics of immigration, food, and diplomacy better illustrated than the small city of Oxford, Ohio, which is home to Miami University, where I used to work. There recently opened Chinese-owned establishments such as Tong Dynasty cater largely to a Chinese customer base. These owners still believe Chinese food is a form of diplomacy and a platform for success in America. Many exhibit the mentality expressed by China house owner Xiao Hui Joey Yang as gong shuo bu nang zuo mi fan, uh, loosely translated as talk doesn't cook rice. And the phrase to him meant a role for Chinese restaurant owners to actively shape impressions of China and also how Chinese Americans are looked at at a daily level in Ohio. But unlike Wong and his generation, many of the newest restaurant managers, such as Zong Xue of Tong Dynasty, actually see Chinese food as a pursuit of the Chinese dream, a reference to the quest of Xi Jinping for national rejuvenation and the export of Chinese influence and power globally. Restaurants like Tong Dynasty use a uh, hot pot uh, to demonstrate the prestige and power of their culinary heritage and home country. And my chapter explores how the meanings associated with Chinese food in Ohio from the era of Mike Wong and Sino-American rapprochement in Cincinnati in the 1970s to Tong Dynasty and the Chinese dream in Oxford, Ohio today uh, operate. And I look at how Chinese restaurant owners find themselves in this position of trying to gently introduce Ohioans to authentic Chinese food, while also pursuing their own dreams of prosperity and societal influence of mainstream America. This sudden influx of Chinese students to Oxford has resulted in a burst of businesses catering almost exclusively to those students. Over 10 new Chinese-owned enterprises have opened since 2012, and most of them are located just off campus on High Street, restaurants such as Tong Dynasty, Yum Yum, and Chun Shir Kitchen. Across Oxford, though, there's also emerged new Chinese-owned groceries, clubs, housing, bakeries, and even soon a fitness center. Throughout the year, Oxford city officials actually field three to four requests a month for retail space from Chinese entrepreneurs and companies. And the city of Oxford has looked very favorably upon the investment and contributions of these businesses to the local economy. These new businesses like Tong Dynasty and Yum Yum all primarily specialize in Sichuan cuisine, but also offer staples of Northern China, such as hot pot, mala tong, and fu qi fei pian. Hoping to capitalize on the student demand for comfort food, each restaurant employs mostly green card, green card holders recruited from Sichuan as its staff and chefs to guarantee the food's quality and identity. However, this introduction of so many new international students and Chinese-owned businesses in such a short period of time has also produced tension and controversy. University faculty and staff have raised academic concerns about the need for greater advising and institutional resources to aid international students. But there's also a more sinister anonymous faculty letter that is circulated calling the Chinese students a dead weight in the classrooms. This misperception persists in spite of the fact that these international students are actually recruited by universities like Miami and also Ohio State and the University of Cincinnati and nationally more broadly. And their tuition helps to lower costs for domestic students and sustain higher education in the US. Discontent among many American students ranges from casually racist complaints about the quote smell of Chinese food to annoyance that the language barrier at the new restaurants has made them feel unwelcome and unwanted in these establishments. 
The sudden arrival of Tong Dynasty and Yum Yum and Chun Shir Kitchen and others have left this sense that cultural diplomacy is running into some issues. And within this context, university officials, civic leaders, and the owners and managers themselves have done a really good job to alleviate a lot of these fierce intentions. Much of the community, local cities, campus faculty, and students look positively on the transformation of the town as an expression of its diversity and its economic vibrancy. Local patronage of the new arrivals like Tong Dynasty represents an embrace of Ohio's integration into the global economy, of multiculturalism, and stronger relations with China. But it also means an acceptance of a world in which Chinese immigrants are powerful, rich, and enjoy power and clout in the United States. And that too leaves a lot of latent anxieties and tensions. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Jenny and Maggie, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Anthony. That was a wonderful presentation. Chuck Kwan grew up in Singapore, Hong Kong, and Japan. His Chinese restaurant television series brings together his diasporic experiences and love of food and travel. Today, we will see the selections of his show highlighting Chinese experiences in Turkey, Argentina, Cuba, and Brazil. Last time I was here, I ate at the only Chinese restaurant in town. I remember I ordered mushroom chicken and stir-fried vegetables. I enjoyed the food, but I was more impressed with the fact that the restaurant owner had allegedly walked here all the way from China. I'm back again, 25 years later, determined to find a Chinese restaurant and meet that man. I'm in Buenos Aires looking for another story about a Chinese restaurant owner. But instead, I find myself drawn to the famous dance halls around the city. I've always been fascinated by tango, that passionate and melancholy dance that originated here. I'm hoping that I'll meet a restaurateur who loves the tango as much as I do. People have told me about the legendary Spring Road King of Argentina. So I set out one afternoon to look for him. Sunrise on the Amazon. There is nothing like it anywhere in the world. I'm traveling down this legendary river to the city of Manaus, hoping I'll get lucky and find a Chinese restaurant. I'm convinced that if I do, the owner will have quite a story to tell. But today, I've joined a one-day boat tour to get a taste of life on this magnificent river. On the boat, I meet Jack Soon, who's quite knowledgeable about the river. In fact, he's giving a guided tour to a delegation from mainland China. I knew he had to be a local resident, but imagine my surprise when I find out that he's the owner of the only Chinese restaurant in Manaus. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm Chuck Kwan. I'm uh, happy to, to share with you 
uh, a, a Chinese restaurant TV series that I made. It's a 15 episode restaurant series. And what you have witnessed is our three uh, beginning episodes of uh, Turkey uh, and uh, Brazil, and of course, Argentina. So I'm gonna uh, put on my uh, PowerPoint slide and share with you my talk. So for four years between 2000 and 2004, I uh, went around the world. I went to 13 countries and produced 15 stories of what I call tales from the modern Chinese diaspora. And it, it, it's part food channel, part history channel, part uh, national geographic, and of course, part travel, um, in which I talk about the immigration history of the Chinese into the host country, the arts and culture, and of course the social, political, and historical context of which in which these Chinese restaurants exist. Uh, I went to seven uh, Latin uh, American American continent uh, rest, uh, countries, uh, two Caribbean, one North America, and and four in uh, Brazil, uh, in uh, in South America. The first one I went to was in San Fernando, Trinidad. And uh, I, I'm, I'm doing a bit of a playful kind of tabloid headline that you'll see at the bottom of the, of the slide, where I imagine uh, what would a tabloid from like New York Post would say about this story. And, uh, and because I was there during the carnival in 2000, and so I had this tabloid headline called Great Wall Owner Played Mass mass being the masquerade in Trinidad's carnival. My next story came from Havana, uh, of which an, a little episode you'll see uh, at the, uh, this uh, Frank Sinatra from Havana singing. Uh, this guy is called the, Ch the Chinese from the carnival, El Chino del Carnaval, and he croons a Frank Sinatra and a Nat King Cole song in uh, Barrio Chino, uh, which is Chinatown. Then uh, we move up north to Canada, Outlook, Saskatchewan, uh, where uh, a Chinese restaurant, Chinese cafe, which is all over the prairies in Canada, I assume everywhere else in, in the US, uh, Rockies and, and so forth. And this character is called Noisy Jim. He came to Canada as a paper son uh, with somebody else's identity papers. And then uh, the, the, the headline says Noisy Jim died uh, because I was, I, after I filmed him, he died about a year and a half uh, after I left. So I went back to his funeral and I filmed his funeral and that's all included in my episode. Uh, and I have here a picture of him hugging a white waitress. I put it there uh, for a very specific reason because in the, I believe up to the 50s, um, there were a few provinces in Canada and I assume there are many states in the US that prohibits Chinese restaurant owners from or Chinese businesses from hiring white uh, people, especially white waitresses. And you're not supposed to, Chinese are not supposed to fraternize, uh, fraternize with uh, white people and much less hugging a, a, a young, beautiful waitress here. So this is the kind of a, a story of the uh, very typical North American migration of railroad builders, uh, gold diggers, uh, and it's spreading the Chinese restaurant trade into the prairies. Uh, Lima, Peru, um, a uh, neighbor to our previous presentation in Chile, uh, in which I talk a lot about Chifa, uh, the name for Chinese restaurants in Peru, and also Peruvian Chinese food. And here's a Matisse doctor. He's, a, he's a, actually a 25-year doctor, practicing doctor, 
who took over a, a, a rundown Chinese restaurant in in uh, in Chinatown, Lima, and uh, and and made it made Chinese food respectable again in Lima. I was in the uh, 2002 World Cup final uh, in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and uh, these are my two characters from the Chinese restaurant celebrating uh, uh, Brazil's win over Germany on that day. Uh, and the guy on the right is the, is, is the son of the Chinese restaurant owners. And it's a couple who swam uh, from mainland China to Macau uh, for the freedom during the 1967 Cultural Revolution. Finally, you saw that uh, just now in Buenos Aires, uh, uh, this guy in front of a very famous bar, it was featured in one of Wong Kar Wai's movie. I there especially because I want to pay homage to Wong Kar Wai and uh, and uh, he he uh, I, I went to Argentina specifically because I'm I'm passionate about tango and I want to feature somebody who who would dance tango uh, as a Chinese restaurant owner and finally you saw that uh, the other one that uh, of Manaus uh, in the Amazon uh, at, at one time the only Chinese restaurant uh, in in the Amazon rainforest. So basically, I, I deal a lot with uh, historical pasts. I talk about Turkic tribes in Central Asia, how they married the princesses to the Chinese uh, court. I talk about how Islam got into, uh, was introduced into um, China, the Silk Road to the Mediterranean, uh, and the Admiral Zhen He, seven voyages that went all the way to South Africa. And finally, Hakka migration. Uh, Hakka are the Han Chinese who uh, migrated for uh, 2,000 years uh, from central China all the way to the south, and of course, uh, to Caribbean, to, to uh, Latin America, and to everywhere else. And Hakkas are known as the Jews of China. I, of course, um, modern Chinese history is something that is very pertinent to, uh, because a lot of people came out during these days. Um, um, that's the reason for emigration. So you have the Sino-Japanese War, you have the Communist uh, uh, Revolution of 1949, Cultural Revolution of 1966, and then the Hong Kong riots of 1968. Finally, I place the entire um, Chinese restaurant into a world context. I went to Israel to talk about um, a Christian family who moved from Vietnam as a boat people um, and gone to Israel. Uh, South African apartheid, uh, Castro's revolution for obviously, uh, and then of course, uh, Brazil's fifth World Cup. So all of this I deal with in terms of politics, of identity, uh, whether you're an expatriate or a citizen, and of course, racism and discrimination, which many Chinese restaurant owners face, and as well as their assimilation and uh, into what we call in the Western uh, Hemisphere melting pot of the American and Canadian uh, society. So this is basically uh, uh, my story. And... Uh, uh, I'll be happy to answer any uh, questions afterwards. Uh, the The film is available on uh, online on uh, as well as on DVD from my website, and you can get the, that information uh, from me uh, later on. I will let uh, uh, Maggie play the uh, final video of the. Uh, yeah. Ding 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 mi ilusión pues siempre pensaba en Shanghai una china uní con mí 
y después que aprendí a bailar con cubana el lico son yo sentí una gran emoción por Cuba y sus Futebol para mim é a minha maior paixão. Eu, futebol para mim é, é é muito mais que um esporte. Alguns brasileiros diz, dizem que é uma religião. Todos aqui no Brasil um, seguem o futebol, uh, cada um com seu time, é uma grande paixão e todos juntos uh, torcemos pela seleção. Eu, eu sou um chinês brasileiro, mas em muitos aspectos eu sou mais brasileiro que chinês. Okay, thank you everyone. And thank you, Chuck, for letting those two videos be shown today. Um, I'm now gonna ask all of our panelists to turn on their videos and their microphones so we can begin the Q&A session. And thank you for everyone. You guys have lost so, or asked so many great questions and we're gonna try to get through as many as possible. Um, and for right now, we've selected um, a few that we wanna ask our panelists. So we're gonna go in the order in which everyone presented. So um, our first question, from David for Hong Yong is how was the labor set up or the structure in a Chinese restaurant kitchen? Um, what is the pecking order and how is it and how is the management of Chinese kitchen different from restaurant Western restaurants? Hi. Hi, thank you. Thanks David for the question. Um, this is a question that I didn't answer in my chapter. Uh, if you have read it, um, you know, um, there's a very interesting aspect of uh, Chinese restaurants through the labor's perspective. Um, um, to answer from the like my personal observation, and um, I think Chinese restaurant um, has a different sensorial experience from the kitchen's perspective by speaking with a lot of descendants who work in the restaurant in the 40s, 50s as a busboy or something. Um, then there's a sense of informality in the kitchens of Chinese restaurants that's different than the typical standard American restaurant. Um, there's a strong emphasis on efficiency and things to have to move fast. And in the kitchen, you always just yell and I want something and you give it to them. It's very, very quick. And so, um, and I think that reflects a sense of um, a laborness in Chinese restaurant work in general. Um, it's very hard work. And um, I would love to explore further about the kind of the design perspective um, by speaking with um, other kind of descendants or especially um, something we were going to explore with the Robert Yeh company, which created the, um, you know, the stove top for walks and started in the 1910s. So that would really help us to explore kind of spatial aspect, um, um, how that's different from the American restaurant. I hope this helps answer your question to some extent. Thank you. And I'm gonna just note that some of your questions are super academic and super like some of the questions are being asked. So thank you for those because I know that um, 
presenters, you guys worked really hard to like make sure that you know this was very you know accessible language. I think is what I asked for. So I can see from the chats that everyone's been super impressed with them um, in your guys' presentations. And then Jacob, I have a few questions of you that are just fun. I know you said you would have some family joining that might throw some oddballs out there. But your first question is, on Christmas Day, do uh, Jewish people usually eat Chinese dinner before or after a movie? Um, well, uh, well, I, I don't know if there's an academic way to answer that, but um, <laughs> I think typically the joke was that, you know, what do Jews do on Christmas? They go out for Chinese food and go see a movie. Really did have the basis in the fact that those were the only things open in most towns on Christmas Day. And in a lot of smaller towns, I'm sure the movie theater was not. Um, now I, I have found, I haven't been to a movie on Christmas Day in the last few years, but I have eaten Chinese food um, pretty much every year, either on Christmas Eve or Christmas. And, and I've found that it's, it's not, um, it does not seem to be an exclusively sort of Jewish practice anymore. I think there are a lot of uh, Christian families and a lot of non-religious families and uh, people who are not Christian or Jewish, but of any number of other faiths that uh, it's a nice way to sort of get out of the house that day. Maybe you've had a lot of cooking and you've produced some big family meals and it's just nice to, I think as my mother-in-law said, it's just nice to have someone cook for you the next day because usually we <laughs> put out big meals um, for groups of friends that come into town for Christmas. So um, Although I think to answer the question directly, you go to dinner first and then you go see the nighttime movie. That's that's my non-definitive, definitive answer to that. Yeah, in my family, we will often go to movies on Christmas as well, um, just because like some of our Christmas traditions are changing. But yeah, um, I like that question. So um, now I'm gonna get into some deeper questions and this is for Nick and Rick. Um, so bear with me as I ask it. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the driving forces behind these shared spaces of home and restaurant in the San Gabriel Valley? I thought that this might be the result of the forceful creation of ghettos for Chinese Americans, separating them from white Americans. But it's very interesting that it's a suburb and that the population size is significantly larger than a Chinatown. Do you know what the size of this white population is in the San Gabriel Valley? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, well, I think we'll both probably have a little something to say about this, but I can start if that's okay, Rick. Um, just that I, I, I want to second the part of your kind of question comment that, um, uh, yeah, it, it's it's very different than um, something that seems forced, right? It, it's it feels very different than a forced migration. I mean, these were um, again people tapping into real estate markets boosted um, by um, real estate developers um, seeking to draw um, Chinese immigrants um, to the suburbs. Um, um, and I, th so I think was, was the last part, Maggie, the, a question about the percentage of so, um, about white size. population, white population yeah. in San Gabriel Valley like today? Yeah, okay. I, I don't know that either of us are able to answer the white because there's there's actually a couple other pieces to it. So I might just add a few things. Um, actually, one of the things that we found in our chapter was that the plurality, meaning not the majority, but the, the, the largest single component would be people who on the US census form um, designate themselves as Latino or Hispanic. Um, you know, does that mean that they cross with uh, other ethnicities or they identify in different ways? It might, that, that's the kind of information that we have. Um, the, the population that uh, notes that it, it is Chinese or Chinese American is about a quarter uh, overall population in San Gabriel Valley. Um, but there's other Asian ethnicities and sometimes there's, you know, people might identify as multiple things. Um, there's a significant Vietnamese population, Korean, um, and, and I, actually I'll bring this in. Um, well, it's not a, a large proportion, um, but Japanese American, which does go back further, um, does get to that kind of uh, earlier part of the question that talks about ghettoization and um, the kind of this, this forced segregation. 
And we do write very briefly about this in our chapter about the, the redlining processes. So one of the things that we're, we've been very interested in, um, not just in this chapter, but also in, in our own work uh, elsewhere, is the set of laws and rules that have been applied here. And one of those things has been the Homeowners Loan Corporation and that process of redlining. So there was uh, an early Asian American population in the San Gabriel Valley that, that was Japanese American, um, mostly because they were redlined out of other places. And it's also, it's one of the reasons that there's such a significant uh, Mexican American population as well. So, you know, it's not to say that this was not because of um, some kind of forced segregation, but it's, but, you know, there was that um, kind of ugly history that, that does kind of underline this. Yeah, and it's it's really important to just to make clear that um, because there were different kind of um, perhaps better real estate opportunities for Chinese moving to the San Gabriel Valley does not um, mean that there wasn't a lot of conflict and tension, racially motivated conflict and tension, um, especially coming from what used to be the major majority white population in these um, you know, um, post-war quintessential built environment, white flight architectural spaces. Um, so that transformation ha isn't and hasn't come easily as you might expect. Um, uh, but it, it does, it just points to a very, very different process than, you know, I think the, the key context to understanding what we're trying to do is just to keep in mind the Chinatown, the U United States Chinatown you think of in San Francisco or New York, and just how radically different this whole process was in making, or, or the one in downtown Los Angeles, or even yeah, or even which, the one which also had its own that which also has its own long, rough, tumultuous uh, racial history. Yeah, yeah, kind of what you're saying is similar to um, how you know San Francisco has its Chinatown, but also the Richmond and uh, Sunset districts of San Francisco are called like additional Chinatowns, and um, so similar. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, very absolutely. Yeah, and absolutely. If I could add one other little footnote to this about the downtown Chinatown, um, the one that I showed is one that was kind of built as a an aesthetic of Chinatown um, from a from a, an earlier displacement of the Chinese population um, when the freeways were built and before that, actually the the rail station, the Union Station, in the 1920s. Um, many of the, the earliest Chinatown um, geographic areas were displaced from those um, and only kind of purposely moved into the, that downtown Chinatown um, with those displacements. So in the 1920s with the rails and then in the 1950s with the freeway construction. Okay, thank you, Nick and Rick. Moving on, Anthony, um, your question comes from Aaron and his question is, um, is the use of America first a form of nationalism that is all encompassing of America? Or would you say that the phrase America first is innately driven to the cause division between Americans and true Americas? Since nationalism doesn't ever seem to really mean loyalty to a country, but more so an allegiance to a party. Wow. Great yeah. question. <laughs> Wish that I'd thought of that question while I was writing my chapter. Um, yeah, so I, I don't really spend too much time breaking down or analyzing that slogan um, in my chapter, but I think Aaron's inclinations, his instincts there, especially on the latter part of like seeing this as a divisive force, definitely. I think that's either its intent or its interpretation, and most likely both, right, is that this is a divisive force. And especially the latter half of Aaron's question kind of talks about this of like, you know, a shot at a party. Well, I think its intent is to divide, right? And to like use nationalism as a force to say there's some, the other party has betrayed America's interests or has not put national interests front as a priority. And part of that betrayal, right? has been that this other party is like working in the interests of racial others, uh, either at home or abroad, and most likely both. And so, yeah, I think 
I think Aaron's kind of got the answer to his own question there of like seeing in that way. And I would say that largely that's, that's how I've interpreted that slogan, but I'd be interested to hear from others on the panel uh, uh, if they have like a different perspective. I'll let everyone think about that for a little bit. Um, but if you guys have any, you know, if you have anything that you want to contribute uh, later, let us know. And while you're thinking, I'm going to throw the next question to Chuck. Um, Chuck, we had a question about your documentary series. Many people, one, want to know where to watch it, which um, we sent the link to people to see. Another question was, what was your uh, the most memorable story that you worked on during the documentary series? Um, you can see it. Uh, you can go to my website, Chinese Restaurants. Dot TV. Uh, it will, you can buy the set of DVD from there. It's a uh, five disc. Uh, I know that there are two uh, other websites that has show my video for free. Uh, one is Link TV out of uh, San Francisco. So if you go to Link TV, L I N K T V dot O R G and search for Chinese restaurants, you'll, you will see all the episodes there as well. Um, my most memorable, I, I've made sort of a, um, 15 episodes. I combined three episodes into a film. And I have five films that went on to film festivals and so forth, besides uh, each episode is being shown on TV. Um, and I always kind of, when I look back, I always look at my last, last the third and last of the, each film uh, happens to be my favorite ones. Uh, it turns out that way, maybe subconsciously, I, I put them there because I wanted to uh, bring it to a finale of my film. So in, in order of, uh, I'm, uh, I'm talking about Turkey, Canada, uh, Cuba, uh, Argentina, and then uh, Mumbai, India. So I would say those are my film. But I was, I was telling somebody else today that uh, asking for my favorite is like asking which kid do I like most in, in my, among my children? So it's very hard to do. Thank you. Um, I have a question that's just in general for um, anyone can answer this question. So um, we have a question from Peter that says, it seems that Chinese restaurants are usually treated as a monolith with no differentiation for the different types. Um, has anyone produced a taxonomy of Chinese restaurants? And Jenny, you might be able to help as well. I know you're you're hiding back there behind the scenes, which is thank you, but you might be able to help. <laughs> I, would, I would guess oh. Jenny, you're not, uh, you're muted still. I'm gonna yeah. Um, well, there are actually lots of notable Chinese food scholars, such as uh, Dr. Eugene Anderson. His book, uh, The Food of China, is very. Uh, influential to Chinese food scholars, but a taxonomy of all of that, I'm going to throw that to Jean. <laughs> oh, and Jean, are you still with us? I mean, there's also just, you know, regional. It's the, the taxonomy basically breaks down as various regions of China. Okay, I have to be unmuted. I've had to get back on line here. So it's, yeah, remind me what I'm... A taxonomy of all Chinese restaurants? Oh, good heavens. Nobody could do that. We're talking about the San Gabriel Valley. There are Burmese Chinese American restaurants. And the, there are Uyghur Chinese American restaurants. There are, um, there are, you know, ethnic minority, you know, Chinese ethnic minority, like Dong, you know, Dong An and uh, uh, Zhuang and stuff restaurants. I mean, you couldn't possibly taxonomize this. There are niche markets you wouldn't believe in the San Gabriel Valley. I add to that, uh, I would say there are a lot of hyphenated uh, Chinese restaurants. Um, you know, in uh, Peruvian Chinese is a very spe specific brand, as you can. Oh, yeah. oh sure, we have, our, uh, we have our Peruvian Chinese restaurants in Los Angeles, too. That's right. yeah. Yeah, and they advertise as such, although, you know, cheap food is very much like traditional American Cantonese food. Kind so of. Probably, okay. uh, they have a guinea pig or two. 
there's a, you know, there are also, you know, a lot of Peruvian twist to it. Um, you know, the previous speaker from Santiago talked about the influx of Peruvian Chinese into uh, Santiago de Chile. Well, I was so, just fascinated to learn that there's a uh, Venezuela, Venezolano Chinese food, which is now in Chile. Yeah. I know you're getting a Chilean Venezuelan Chinese food. Uh, this is really getting wonderful. <laughs> yeah. My, the other thing, of course, is very popular in Toronto is the Into Hakka food. Indo Chinese from Calcutta. Oh, uh, yeah. The dominant uh, uh, immigrants from India, Chinese yeah. immigrants from India. Yeah. And their food is uh, a, a like combination of subtle Cantonese plus fiery Indian. So that's the yeah. best way to put it there. Yeah. I knew this was a big deal in India and was coming to <coughs> Canada. I haven't tried it yet. In fact, Eugene and I were on a, we were quoted in the same uh, New York Times article way back in 2005, I think. On There's a big article about hyphenated American, uh, hyphenated Chinese food in New York and everywhere else. So uh, this Peruvian, this uh, Colombian, there is uh, Indian, and of course, everything else under the sky. Well, I lived beef briefly in Singapore in 1971, and... Since then, I kind of track Singaporean food through friends, and uh, there have been several revivals of, you know, what they call Nonya food, the kind of Hawking yeah. Chinese hybrid with Malaysian food that came from, you know, marriages between Malays and Hokkien people, and uh, it's fantastic food. It's, it's wonderful, but it's gone through several cycles of decline and, and rebirth with always some changes on the, when, it, when it's reborn. Yeah. Okay. So it sounds like maybe um, it seems like it's maybe a bigger task than just simply a taxonomy. I see um, there's also a comment that, you know, we could think about categorizing a different way. So it sounds like the answer is no, it's a possibility that could happen just with a lot more um, how it's going to be organized into a taxonomy. It's a brain and river. It's yeah. like... Uh, you know, trying to figure out a river course below a glacier where the channels are separating and remerging and separating and remerging and so on. Uh, Sidney Chung, who wrote the, the foreword for our book, has uh, done a lot of dynamite work on this. He's really terrific. Yeah. Uh, Han Yang, did you want to make a comment? Oh, uh, I just want to kind of, I think taxonomy, I don't know if architectural morphology is sort of kind of a taxonomy and I just want to address that a little bit. I think um, the construction of Chinese restaurant, the design, um, there's a really kind of major motive behind it is to build stereotypes, you know, that and all those architectural were really, you know, architecture, Chinese architecture is not monolithic. And, but in America is largely those um, kind of Chinese um, imperial architecture. Um, but they were really, not where the Cantonese or Nagel architecture really represent, you know, and the villages, if you've been to any Cantonese villages. So I think that was constructed based on kind of a um, 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 stereotypical understanding about Chinese architecture. And, and there's a, there was the intention to really make it really not diverse. Uh, and it's good. The question is really great to re kind of recognize diversity. And that's really a kind of a force to go against the discourse of Orientalism, right? We consider all Asians as the same. We consider all Chinese architecture as the same. They all look like the Forbidden City. They're not. They have a, a larger variety behind it. Um, and, and I think it's important to re recognize there's a power relationship be behind the construction of Chinese uh, architecture in, from the perspective of the building environment. And um, that kind of uh, content, that kind of a multitude, um, um, actually of the culture, but it's becoming really more diverse after 65 and the regional cuisine become um, more available. Um, but I think there's still more kind of work to do with in terms of architecture. It's not really as diverse as the cuisine itself yet. Um, so I thought that was something maybe interesting to share. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, American um, Chinese architecture is a thing in itself, like American Chinese food. I noticed that just in the last 20 years or so, we've begun to start thinking of American Cantonese food as instead of bad, phony Chinese food, it's American Chinese food. It's a new and different thing, which I think is progress. 
I'm just glad to see people aware that this is a separate tradition rather than, you know, I mean, I, I never use the word authentic. I banished it from my vocabulary. <laughs> Well, thank you. So I'm going to go back to uh, asking questions one-on-one -on -one for uh, the speakers. And so, Hong Young, back to you. Um, a question from Pauline. Um, um, do you know what happened to the toy building and is it still standing in Milwaukee? Um, I try to address it in the chat. Um, it's demolished. Um, um, it, it was demolished before the second restaurant started. Um, and um, so different from like Rick and Nick, presented. Um, all the three restaurants were in the downtown area, you know, sort of the ethnic enclave, like LA Chinatown. Um, and renovation, urban renewal, you know, kind of really did, kind of made many Chinese restaurants, like Chinatown, were like started disappeared, you know, like Sacramento, Chinatown, and other areas. So it's no longer there. Um, okay. And then just, um, since you had already answered that, do you know how Mr. Toy initially gained capital for his first restaurant? Yeah, thank you for asking that. I think it's a really good way to look at um, the really life, everyday lives of Chinese immigrants um, that who came during the gold rush. Um, as you might know, many, you know, the transcontinental uh, railroad that Chinese were part of, and that's something Chinese did and they, started from that and then later many Chinese, specifically for Charlie Toy, he did farm. He farmed in San Francisco. He worked as a houseboy um, in San Francisco. And that's how many Chinese started, uh, like himself, started accumulating some sort of capital for himself. And specifically in Wisconsin, he had an import store. So he was managing import business. Then um, he finally had enough money to open the restaurant. But the life journey of you know farming, domestic help, that was really shared by many many early Chinese immigrants, especially in California. Chinese houseboy were very very prevalent, and many Chinese people gained some sort of capital through the help from the white employers. They had a really meaningful relationship for some of them, um, so and that helped Charlie Tui as well. Um, so hopefully that's answered the question. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, back to Jacob. Um, so here's your academic question. It says, so the Jewish community found the acceptance and tolerance from other migrants who experienced great discrimination and prejudice. With this um, being observed and recognized, was there ever an increase in Chinese becoming Jewish themselves? Um, wow, really interesting question. Uh, uh, I think like all of our answers to all of these questions, it, it, kind of comes in, in a, a bunch of different parts. So I do not know the numbers on, uh, in terms of American Chinese people converting to Judaism in America. I, I wouldn't profess to be able to answer that. I'm sure it happens. Anyone can convert if they want to go through the process. They are certainly not excluded. Um, but yes, I think there is a certain part of the story in a lot of these, uh, particularly back towards the turn of the century, um, or the first half of the 20th century at least, there, there is sort of a lot of kind of underdog nature of, of Jews wanting to support these communities and finding comfort in them and, and not feeling discriminated in their restaurants. The flip side of that is there's plenty of oral histories that I was reading in interviews with folks who distinctly remember while they love uh, and felt accepted by the restaurant owners and servers in the restaurant, the staff, that they are ashamed of how their own parents or grandparents or fellow Jews were racist towards the Chinese staff in those restaurants, mocking their accents or difficulty speaking English. One of the sort of uh, universal ways across all white immigrant populations in terms of gaining acceptance by broader white Amer American culture has been to exhibit racism towards non-whites. Irish did it, Italians did it, Jews did it. And so there, there was a segment of Jews who felt um, that they were exhibiting their Americanness or practicing their Americanness by being racist towards non-white people. And so it, it is a, a sort of give and take in terms of, there, there is no sort of universal 
yes, they found acceptance and both groups were universally supporting of each other. Um, on the flip side, there's been a Jewish community in China. The, the Kaifeng Jews have been there. They built a synagogue in, I think, the mid 12th century, but some scholars argue they were Mizrahi or Persian Jews who came over on the Silk Road as early as like 600 uh, CE. So um, their descendants now have communities in Israel where those Chinese Jews have now uh, reclaimed or you know made their claim to live in the Jewish homeland. Um, and so I guess that's a long way of saying, I actually don't know the answer if there was an uptick in American <laughs> versus becoming or converting to Judaism. There is a lot of intermarriage. There is a lot of um, Jewish and various uh, Asian cultures uh, intermarrying. Um, and that's its own whole beast of issues that we certainly don't need <laughs> to get into here. But um, I don't know. And also, I'd love to know if someone, <laughs> if someone has any numbers on it. But uh, in terms of a hard uptick in conversions, I, I could not give you the answer. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to try to fire through the next couple questions so everyone gets a chance to answer at least two. So next for Nick and Rick, um, did you conduct any studies about the organization of Chinese uh, restaurants in comparison to Chinese neighborhoods? Um, were urban Chinese areas organized with restaurants on the edges? Yeah, I think... Well, so the, I'll, I'll give a very quick answer here. Um, this is a general uh, uh, pattern that's that's common throughout urban planning. So this is basically the the commercial being on the main roads and then um, a population being in the neighborhoods and, and living. Um, that's one of the things that made this attractive is that it, it followed all of the typical patterns of U.S. housing stock. And as Nick had pointed out, um, this was a housing stock that had existed and a, a Chinese and Chinese American population that's kind of inhabited it, made it its own, opened the restaurants, but hasn't had to kind of um, make it, uh, you know, into a, a, a Chinatown. It's, it's essentially Southern California landscape that happens to have Chinese restaurants and Chinese Americans or, or Chinese immigrants living there. Okay. Nick, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, yeah. No, other than like, I guess even a shorter answer is no. Um, we didn't, do <laughs> we didn't, um, for example, even though we're both geographers by training, we didn't um, like do a GIS analysis of numbers of populations and demographic stats compared to location and type of food of restaurants. Um, mm -hmm. That is a fantastic project waiting to happen, absolutely no doubt. Um, now our methodology, and actually there's an interesting section, um, or interesting to me at least, <laughs> in our chapter about um, uh, kind of our methodology, which is very much a, um, I think we interpret it as coming from a um, sort of um, deductive, artistic, visual, photographic method. Um, in just, I think the project is, is less born from a statistical equivalency, geographical equivalency, as it is from um, experience in going there and wondering like, well, what if you walk three blocks that way? Um, most people don't, um, unless you live there. Um, what if you, <laughs> uh, like, and, and then recognizing, of course, that this is the majority of the, of the land mass um, in this region and, trying to come or just make sense of um, the the sort of um, you know if you're into Chinese restaurants make sense of the global fame of the San Gabriel Valley <laughs> with the people who are actually living there okay. thank you so Anthony your next question um, how do Chinese regional uh, migration patterns and the related food cultures contribute to differences in Chinese restaurants across the US? And I can add more detail if you need to. No, another really hard, interesting question, right? Um, this is one too where I feel like I can offer a little bit of insight, but if other panelists wanna jump in. Um, I think regional migration patterns uh, 
are one way to make sense of the distribution of different types of food. And certainly we're emphasizing there is enormous diversity um, within what's being called Chinese cuisine, right? Um, but I also want to stress, this is my answer to that question of like historical context really, really matters. Like if you read books on the history of like certain fare, chop suey, right? Then that makes sense. There's less possibility for diversity or variation um, in certain historical eras. And then after 1945, you start to see the possibility for regional patterns to develop. Local palates matter a lot too, right? So like who's around them and who's their customer base. So those two things, where people come from, where they arrive and when, which historical context is, I think, part of the explanation for why you see um, these variances. But if anybody else wants to take a stab at that question, have at it. Okay, again, I'm gonna let everyone get a chance to think about that if you do have an answer. Um, right now, Chuck, your last question, um, do you have in your, like, in your opinion from working on your documentary series, um, was there like a common theme of Chinese migration you came across through your travels? Um, well, it's a bit, little bit cliche, but I think it's very, a lot of it is very true. Uh, family values, education, um, uh, as well as love of Chinese food. And, and this is the, um, you know, I, I always look at the diaspora as the, the three biggest diaspora are the Jewish, the Indians, and the Chinese. They're everywhere around the world. And when I made my film, everywhere I went, there was also the Indian diaspora and the Jewish diaspora. And uh, so, you know, I think I think if you ask a lot of these people, they're they're basically you know very similar answer, you know, education and family value. So very cliche and very typical are Chinese restaurant owners sacrificing themselves for the next generation so that their kids can go to Harvard uh, while they labor in the, in the Chinese uh, kitchen, right, in Milwaukee. So this is very typical of uh, what I see is, is, is the migration kind of thing. And of course, uh, the migration history is, is, of course, very tied to the whole world context of wars and famines and dynasty changes and revolution and uh, and of course job opportunities uh, as in North America you're building the railroad and uh, Chinese laborers are, are skilled uh, at, at dynamite at, at least I know in Canada so they've been used in dynamiting our tunnels in the Canadian Pacific Railroad um, and of course after they after that, they all face racism. And uh, in fact, when I was in Cuba, I discovered a whole, a lot of racism in the States at that time that caused a lot of people to go to Cuba because they couldn't, uh, they couldn't take it in California. They had to run away. And they ran away to Chile, uh, to Peru, and, uh, and, uh, and to a lot of Central American uh, companies, uh, countries. So, it's, it's a very global kind of way of looking at things, but it's certainly very, um, there is a, certainly a pattern in these migration. Uh, same thing go with yeah. the other mm -hmm. Jewish people and, and Indian people as well. Cool. Just kind of wrap up. There's a lot of questions I see that um, just, we had time with everyone. We thought everyone would get to answer like two, three questions. So if your question was unanswered, please contact CHSA. Um, our email is info at chsa.org and we will put you in contact with our presenters today so they can talk more about the question and go into more research um, because this was, again, just a little snapshot of the chapter in the work that they're doing. I want to kind of wrap up and just, you know, it's Chinese New Year. Can all our uh, speakers tell us what your favorite Chinese food is before we wrap up for today? <laughs> we'll go in uh, just speaker order, I guess. Um, I like the uh, the steamed fish. Um, it's called the uh, yusui. Um, I don't know how to usually lu yu in in Mandarin, but it's pretty much just steam it and um, like you know drizzle some soy sauce on the top. It's ginger, you know, steam is ginger and green garlic. Very simple. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, I'm a sucker for the classics that I grew up with, uh, Lo Mein and, and uh, fried rice, egg rolls, some very distinctly non-kosher dishes, shrimp and walnuts and <laughs> uh, pork spare ribs and all those big delicious mounds of food that are uh, spun around the Lazy Susan in the middle once we can all <laughs> actually go back to, <laughs> knock on wood, go back to these restaurants and enjoy. Thank you. Mine is not a very healthy one. It's the uh, Hakka braised pork belly with mustard green. Mm. That's great. Nick and Rick or Anthony? Yeah, I, so I, I have to say among my favorite is um, Western Chinese, Hushi Corridor, having lived in um, Meimonggu and Ningxia and, and Uyghur food, so, but Sichuan, Henan, I, it's all fine, all good. <laughs> I'll probably go out for dumplings uh, and I'll go to San Gabriel Valley for dumplings in a little bit. Yeah, boy. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take one that I think originally, like many, many years ago, my colleague Rick uh, introduced me to, which is the, the boiled white fish uh, in the soup. And yum. Someone said fish, but it, yeah, that, that's oh, Sichuan. What what, what are cooked? Uh, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What are yeah. cooked fish? Yes, green oh, beans. Yum. Lots of chilies. Yeah. <laughs> thank you all. Yeah. Thank you. Happy New Year. Yeah. Happy New Year. Um. Anthony, Jenny, did you want to add anything, or Jean? Well, I'm trying to think of my favorite Chinese food, but there are so many that I couldn't decide. <laughs> the best Chinese food I ever had was uh, fresh seafood on the waterfront in Hong Kong in the old days when the waters weren't all polluted and fished out, and you could get really, really fresh shrimp and fish on the, you know, restaurants over the sea for a couple of bucks. That was as good as it ever got. My favorite Chinese dishes, food. I think I'll agree with Nick that the that Sichuanese water cooked fish with a lot of chilies and brown pepper is close to my favorite. Um, I love dim sum and mapo tofu. Anthony, what's your favorite? I'm so hungry now. Uh, <laughs> Dan Dan Mian, anything with eggplant, so yusheng chiedza, uh, like all that good stuff. Uh, Huegua raw is one of my favorites, so like lots of pork, anything with pork, yeah. <laughs> Can't go wrong. Yeah, I've always really enjoyed the shrimp rolls um, and I think fried rice. I'm just pretty simple. I really just like fried rice all the time, so those are my favorites. And again, thank you. I'm, I guess everyone's really hungry. It is um, five o'clock. I'm in the Midwest right now. So it's dinner time for some of you who are also in the Midwest. Some of you oh, mid-afternoon right. snack is starting. So thank you again, um, everyone for joining, for our speakers, uh, for Fresno State, for letting us use our Zoom account. We're really appreciative and we're super glad that everything went well. And again, um, you know, this is the second day of Chinese New Year. It's a 15 day celebration. And we really urge you throughout the rest of the month or throughout the rest of the Chinese New Year holiday um, for the rest of the month, the rest of the year to really celebrate Chinese American culture, um, Asian Pacific Islanders, educate others and advocate for, um, you know, our local Chinatowns and our local communities. And we hope that as a community, when we have our Chinese New Year celebration next year, it's not going to be in the middle of a pandemic that we can do this more in a live setting. So again, thank you and have a good afternoon or good night, wherever you are in the world. Goodbye. So long. <laughs>